All right, it looks like we've got a few viewers already, so we're going to wait until our speaker, Mark, joins us. And um, according to the clock on my computer, we still have a couple minutes before uh, 1 o'clock. So to those who are watching, thanks so much for joining us for the peer-to-peer -peer hangout. For those who are watching, if you just want to um, hover over the left side of your screen and make sure that your Q&A app is up. So if you just hover over to the left, you'll see a blue Q&A bubble or speech bubble. And if you click on that, you should have a Q&A bar open up on the right side of your screen. All right, so there's Mark. Great. Hello. Hey. <laughs> All right, we've got five viewers right now, so uh, I think we will, I think according to my clock, it is one o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us for the NAEA Museum Education Division Peer-to-Peer -peer Hangout. Um, my name is Julene Chevalier, and I am part of the Development Committee for the NAEA National Art Education Association Museum Education Division. And um, this is part of the peer-to-peer -peer networking opportunities that members have asked for. And um, I have joined this subcommittee late, so I am just getting to reap the benefits of all the hard work that the other committee members, um, especially spearheaded by Michelle Groey, have, um, have done to set this up. So welcome, welcome. Today um, we are pleased to have Mark Osterman from the Vizcaya Museum and Gardens, and he is the Guiding Programs Manager, and he's going to be speaking to us about professionalizing and integrating the docent program there. Um, before I let Mark take over, I'm going to point out a few things to everybody. Um, this is the third of six of these Hangouts, and so um, at the end of this, I'll remind you of the other ones, but you can also always go to the uh, NAEA Museum Education Division G Plus page to find out the, the details and the times, etc. Um, let's see. We really want to make this as interactive as possible, and so while you'll only be able to hear and see me and Mark, you all who are watching can participate by typing in questions into the Q&A app. So if you, um, in your Google Hangouts window, if you hover over the left side of the screen, you should see a menu bar, and there, there should be a blue Q&A bubble box. And so if you click on that, the Q&A should open up on the right side of your screen. And that's where you can type questions. And um, that's where you can see other people's questions as well. And there's a little plus one. And then as people, you can click on that, which basically means you like it. As more people click on it, the number increases. And that can let me know which questions people are most interested in. And then um, I'll be sure to bring those up to Mark's attention. I think other than that, we are ready to go. So I'm going to hopefully switch the screen. Um, actually, let me turn uh, things over to Mark first and let him introduce himself. And you can see Mark before we start seeing his slides. So take it away, Mark. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Jolene. And thank you, Michelle, for inviting me to join these Hangouts. I think they're a great, great idea to build community, a community across the nation, um, to meet new peers. So today I'm going to be discussing how Vizcaya Museum and Gardens has integrated and attempted to professionalize its volunteer guides. Um, 
I just want to give some context before we get into this PowerPoint that I'll run through that will offer most of my talking points. Um, first off, the inspiration for this uh, discussion was I attended the National Docent Symposium about two months ago with about five volunteer guides who were presenting there. And their presentation intrigued me. Um, it was very engaging to the audience there, and it made me think about how they were talking about these issues from the guide's perspective, and that we as a staff at Vizcaya needed to sort of reorient that and create um, a presentation that would help us look back and reflect on these changes from a staff perspective. The other thing that inspired this is discussions I had with colleagues at the National Docent Symposium whereby many museums have professionalized and have fully integrated their guiding uh, programs into their education departments, but there are many who have not where the volunteer guides or the docents were sort of these, um, these bodies that existed in some ways independent of other aspects of the museum. So they serviced the, the uh, education departments and other facets of the museum through touring and other volunteer uh, in other volunteer capacities, but they weren't fully integrated into the museum and a lot of the needs for those guiding bodies were actually in conflict with what the museum's needs were. So there was some interest in, uh, in this idea and the process that Vizcaya went through. Lastly, I just want to offer a caveat that Vizcaya is a very specific type of museum. So while I think a lot of facets of this uh, process that Vizcaya went through are transferable, there are certainly many that won't be just because of the environment that we have. We're a national historic house. Um, we primarily have static exhibitions, but I'll, I'll get more into that as I go through the presentation. And so what I'll do with this presentation it's a very brief background of Vizcaya so people understand the context that I'm working within and then I'll go through this process that happened in terms of the professionalization and the integration of the volunteer guide program. One last thing I'll mention is I've only been with Vizcaya um, about seven months now so I've sort of been fortunate enough to be given this program where it's at already a high level of integration. I really have to thank my, predecessor, my predecessors and my current colleagues uh, who went through the challenges of that process. So, um, Julian, you can switch to the next slide. Again, I'm just giving a very basic background on Vizcaya. Uh, Vizcaya Museum and Gardens is a National Historic Landmark that preserves the Miami State of agricultural industrialist James Deering. Uh, the museum first opened in 1954. We were first accredited in 1986. You can see an image of the back facade uh, of the museum here that faces the water. You can go to the next slide. This is just a, a little background. James Deering, it was his personal home. James Deering was an industrialist. He was one of the owners of um, a a farming uh, equipment manufacturing firm called International Harvester. He resided in the home from 1916 to 1925. You can go to the next slide. And this is just to give a, a broad base idea of what the museum encompasses. So we have the main house, we have the museum collections. What is not included here is also the archives. We have vast archives of all of the architectural renderings that took place for the construction of the house and the historic village. We also have vast archives of all the correspondence that took place between James Deering and the various players uh, who took part in the construction of the house, so whether it was a chief designer, landscape architect, or the general architect of the home. You'll see, obviously, you can see various images of, um, of the home. The historic village is a little separated from the, the main estate, but we're in the process now of expanding to that. Currently the historic village is not open to the public. You can go to the next slide. So getting back to the focus of this presentation, again offering just a little context. The original form of guiding program, we had a, about 150 guides. There were no schedules. The tours were not interactive. They were completely focused on the history of the sky and art history. 
or at that time, whatever history was of specific interest to the guides. Um, training was solely in art history, no training in facilitation or pedagogy. Uh, there was no recertification process, no self-reflection tools. There were monthly meetings that, with art historical lectures, and there were field trips to other museums. Um, the museum was not run as an accredited museum. It was run by the Miami-Dade Parks Division, and the staff of the museum were not staff that were trained museum professionals. Uh, and what else? Thank you. <laughs> so, with that in mind, the new guiding program, uh, what Vizcaya did was they wanted to look at, well, what are the foundations for the learning division and what philosophies do uh, we try to follow there and how can we imbue those into the new integrated uh, guiding program. So, these bullets here list what are, in essence, the learning division's educational philosophies. So, in every program that we do, we want to respond to the needs of diverse constituent communities, support active and social learning, empower visitors to make personal and meaningful connections with Vizcaya, um, present multiple entry points and perspectives for understanding Vizcaya, demonstrate excellence in content, learning theory, and practice, encourage new ways of thinking, and promote lifelong learning. So these, these concepts are at the heart of all the trainings we go through. And they're also imbued within the, the tours that we created for the guides to then implement in, in, within the museum. You can go to the next slide. So again, just a bullet uh, list of a, the radical switch between the two overalls, and then I'll get into uh, some of the more formal details between the new and the old. So the new museum, the museum's run as an AAM accredited museum with trained professionals in all areas. Training now focuses on touring and facilitation skills rather than uh, the training being an art history course. It's really loaded up specifically uh, thinking about pedagogy um, and methods of engagement, inquiry, etc. There are now required trainings and continuing education sessions annually uh, with a requirement of 72 credits for, for active guides and it's 40 credits for guides who have been with the museum for seven years or more. Um, we now have 30 guides <laughs> who schedule tours every day rather than 150. So part of this process, there was a huge amount of attrition where we lost a lot of the guides who did not agree with the direction that the museum was taking. But this, that idea of attrition was, was planned for. So the idea was to actually have less guides who were more active and had more buy-in to the museum. Um, we have online scheduling software, so guides now schedule themselves on software. We use something called Vlogistics, it's really useful. The guides get to choose which tours they want, so they feel empowered in terms of when they're getting placed and what they're getting placed for. There's biannual recertifications, um, there's self-reflection tools. We have a tool also called the Progression of Practice, which I'll go into detail very soon. We have, we've set up a mentor program so that guides are working with one another, a fair amount of peer learning. Um, and through this process, we fully integrated into the learning division so that the, the, guide, the guide corps are now managed by the guiding program's manager, in this case, myself. And lastly is at the, the last bullet called the GIT, which is our general introductory tour. And I want to talk a little bit about this because this is at the heart of our integration of what was going on because prior guides were just sort of creating tours on their own and we wanted um, a focused tour that could be consistent, that we can control the fidelity of the implementation and that really focused on uh, a visitor-centered approach. Mike, I'm going to, uh, Mark, <laughs> Mark, sorry, <laughs> been doing it all day. Um, Mark, I have a quick question about the attrition and any concerns about that. Uh -huh. were, was, were any staff members concerned that guides would or former docents would leave and you know say unkind things in the community and therefore be bad PR in any way shape or form? It was a concern that technically would go against uh, the letter of commitment that they had signed as 
as active guides. Right. But the museum was willing to take that risk for the reasons I had said, which were the the size and breadth of the corpse uh, required a certain amount of infrastructure and resources to take care of, but it wasn't a balance in terms of what the museum was receiving back. So it's like to get a smaller group that was more active and more uh, more engaged with the museum, and there for the museum's needs, not for the need of being around like-minded peers. <laughs> Thanks very much. You can go to the next slide. So what is the GIT? I just want to go over this brief. Uh, both the general introductory tour and the garden's general introductory tour are designed to be interactive and provide a basic introduction to the concepts behind the creation of the estate. They're approximately 45 minutes in length, and they focus on one big idea, that the sky is a result of European traditions combined with its American, specifically Miami, context. The reason I'm going over this is because these ideas, these foundations of the GIT are used in terms of how we train the guides, how the guides do utilize their own self-reflection tools, and how staff uses uh, their own observation and evaluation tools. So if you could go to the next slide. So this has become an important concept that I'm trying to impart to the guides. What is an effective GIT? So what, what do we as a museum, what is our goal? that when a visitor walks away from participating in one of our tours. And it turns out what our goals are is that, that the visitor interacts with the tour guide, that they understand the tour's big idea, that they perceive the tour to be a worthwhile use of their time, and that they express interest in further learning or action based on their tour experience. This is a big deal, and this was a big part of the training and transition because guides often wanted visitors to walk away with a broad general understanding of neoclassicism or something to do with Rococo or some other art movement or something to do with the Renaissance or a specific artist or an object and sort of in, uh, getting across to them that what we were teaching were broader ideas, they were more conceptual and they were about general engagement and the idea of pushing uh, and modeling ways of looking at and thinking about art helps readjust what the guide's own expectations are for the tour and the content that they give. Can you go to the next slide? So I'm just going to show briefly, there's an image of the entrance hall. And if you go to the next slide, I'm not going to go through this, but what this is is uh, it's a small piece of part of the git. And just what I want to point out here is its structure and how it's set up, because we utilize that structure to then evaluate how, how well the tour is being implemented. So each space has key points. There's often a rhetorical ask. There's often a share. There's often what we call a big ask, and that is often the open-ended question. So the tour ranges between informing the, uh, the visitors but also engaging them with open-ended questions so they can approach the museum, its environments, from multiple perspectives. So in this case, the big ask, what are some of the objects in this space that might suggest European origins? So the idea there is using conditional language. It might suggest. It's not what in this space is of European origin. This allows uh, the guests to just take a guess whether they, they, they feel certain or not. And then another component is the wrap-up by sharing. So the way that some of the rooms are designed is that they're inquiry-based for uh, a visitor to sort of uh, muse what's going on in, in that space, what they think is happening, those opinions are informed by their own personal experiences. And then the wrap up and share allows us to sort of put it all in a, a correct context. So it's not about correcting somebody's perception of what they saw, but it's giving at least the museum's voice in, into that conversation. So first the understanding is constructed by the visitors, and then it's wrapped up. There's a wrap up where the museum is throwing in their, their sort of two cents. So you can go to the next slide. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these, but so right now this is an evaluation tool that I use when I go around with the guides. And as you can see, it's built right out of the construct of the tour. So the, the evaluation looks at how are they presenting shares? Are they uh, using questions to maintain dialogue and open-ended inquiry? So what often happens when I'm, um, when I'm observing guides, you know, one of the biggest challenges is for them to use that conditional language. 
to, to really incorporate open-ended and not close-ended questions. So this works as a tool that's helpful in that manner. Um, are they following up with additional questions? Is the information accurate? Those are more obvious. You could go to the next slide. So it, each page is broken up into a, an approach. So the first one was about content. This is about facilitation. So it actually gets to the hearts of to some of the um, theory that we're incorporating. So you can see, uh, are, is the guide paraphrasing visitors' response? Are they linking visitor responses? And for those of you who are familiar with visual thinking strategies, you can see how we're incorporating some of the core concepts of VTS into um, our methods here. So these ideas of linking, paraphrasing, um, using open-ended inquiry is all part of the types of tour that, tours that we give. You can go to the next slide. This is just the last piece of that evaluation. I'm not going to spend time on it right now, but what we're doing now is we're trying to adjust this evaluation because it has these metrics, emerging, developing, proficient, and essentially a guide's like, what does that mean? What does it mean that I'm developing, and how do I become proficient? So we as a staff realize we need to address that. So if you go to the next slide, you're going to see one way that we're attempting to address this issue. This is just a piece of a document that's in draft form that we're working on. So it's called the progression of practice, and this gets at to how do I improve my practice? How, how can I go through a progression of practice? So we're working on, for example, if you look at the space that says paraphrasing, second from the bottom, you'll see under emerging, it's occasional and basic, under developing, consistent, appropriate and basic, and proficient, consistent, and well-developed. Um, you could also see with linking how it, it, the, the, um, the strategy or the skill set basically becomes more complex, but this type of tool helps give a guide for the guides in terms of how they improve their own practice. Because before, if we're just saying you're emerging or you're developing, it didn't really give them the clues or the tools that they needed to, to move forward in their practice. And you can see our concerns here are based in education and methodology here. So these, you can go back and go ahead now. Thanks, Julie. So I'm just going to run through some of these bullets. Obviously, this was not an easy process. As I said, I've come in on the, on the tail end where most of the hard uh, work has been done. But some of the biggest challenges to go through this process, um, one is inclusivity. So the idea that the guides feel included with the changes that are happening. This caused a, a huge rift because when these changes started to happen, the guides sort of felt they were in a tailspin and they had a long history and tenure with the museum and they, they did not feel included within the process. So part of the attrition, that, that happened. Obviously there were attempts by staff to, to make guides feel uh, included, but it wasn't always successful. So staff buy-in, you need complete staff buy-in, and this is from the executive director throughout the rest of the divisions. Um, without that, it's very difficult because the guides, they're often members of the museum, some are donors, some have strong connections with donors, et cetera, and so forth. So it really needs to be a, an effort that the museum has full buy-in and uh, the museum has articulated that they support this type of change in integration. Obviously, full communication and what, what's going on, what's happening, what the goals are. Slow implementation. So the guides are very, very, very The implementation was actually done quite slowly. As parts of the Git were developed, they were then uh, experimented with, with the guides throughout. So the guides actually took part in the development and the refinement of the Git and that helped with the inclusivity. So lack of trust, obviously, again, with the idea of change, you need to build trust with your guiding corps. Um, guide and flexibility is always a challenge. I don't have a specific answer, but I think, again, making them included with the changes that are happening uh, is useful and helpful. Guide loss of power and control. So as a staff, you need to, if you're really trying to integrate and bring the guiding program into the education department, there's often a loss of, um, of individualism that uh, guiding corps in some uh, contexts have, and you need to sort of mediate how that's going to happen, 
who the guiding corpse is going to be answerable to, et cetera. Staff attrition, if it's a slow implementation, you just need to consider staff itself, people coming and going and trying to maintain a sense of uh, consistency and focus throughout. Willingness for guide attrition. So a program like this is really built on the idea that you are planning to uh, make your corpse smaller, but more engaged and more active. So that needs to be understood and done. Um, and then basic perceptions. That's just in general. So before, before uh, any implementation of changes, perceptions should be discussed on what's happening, what the goals are um, between all the various parties. Mark, I'm going to just jump in with um, a question that Michelle has posed about what kind of resources you use to help um, train and or convince the guides about visitor experience compared to education or teaching. Um, you know, did you find any articles or books useful and, you know, what worked to convince those guides that this was a good way to go about giving tours? So that was a real challenge, and again, that, that process preceded me. I don't have those reading lists with me, but we do have um, a reading list that we incorporate into our trainings, and I can share that or even post it afterwards. I do know that the museum chose to do uh, VTS training, not to implement VTS into our practice, but to give the guides an idea and an introduction into the direction we were moving in, which was visitor-centered. So most of our concepts, you know, centered on that idea, moving away from a directed learning experience to one that was visitor-centered. Um, as I said, there were various articles we utilized, some reps from VTS came down, and I continue to sort of model this idea of the use of inquiry. We also try to utilize some facts from studies that, we were, uh, that we've been involved in trying to say that what we were doing was grounded in best practice within the museum field, trying to use that as evidence. But I think that's often difficult because the guides, as much as they are involved and they are practitioners, they are museum practitioners, the, the, I, I think that uh, research often just comes across as abstract to them. Great, thank you. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Almost done here. So evidence for success. So once this was implemented, the museum employed um, a consultant to do an assessment and evaluation. And we just had a great response. So you can see some of these things here from the, the executive summary of the, the research report. More than 90% of GIT respondents reported that the tour met or exceeded their expectations. 92% um, of GIT respondents and 98% of audio tour felt the tour was a worthwhile use of their time. 90% um, of Git respondents agreed with the statement that their guide was knowledgeable. This is important because one of the resistance that we had was that guides were, they were, they were both upset and worried that we're not giving enough information, we're not giving enough information. You know, we're spending too much time engaging the guests and letting them use, and then we're giving very little bit of information. And they're sort of worried how they come across and what that means. But you can see from the, the, uh, the evaluation that we did that it, the visitors, you know, looked at and felt the guides were, were knowledgeable, you know, had all the information that was necessary and more. So the process was, was definitely a real success. You can go to the next slide. I think that's the end. So that's it. Great. Um, well, there's a lot of great information in there, Mark, and so I'm going to pull up some of the, refer to some of the questions that have been posted. Um, I'm going to, since Michelle just, we just answered one of yours, I'm going to skip to um, Becky's question, and she's curious about how the guides have responded to evaluation. Um, how resistant are they? It sounds like you've been addressing some of their concerns um, by giving them more, by clarifying the rubrics, but is there anything, you know, the eternal question of how to deal with pushback from guides about evaluation? Right, so, and it's been very difficult, and the guides are mortified every time they see me on the floor, even though I 
try to come across as their friend, and I try to talk about that this is a collaboration, you know, this is not a punitive thing, like even if you were to do poorly, we're here just to work together. So all of that helped a little bit, but what I have found to be the most successful tool is that whenever I can, when I'm doing an evaluation, not an informal one, but more of a formal one for a recertification, I incorporate one of the mentor guides. So they feel that they have one of their peers uh, involved in the conversation. And I have found that that's one of the more successful ways to sort of uh, mitigate that, that, that resistance. Like, I don't want to be evaluated. I don't want to be evaluated because there's a sensibility about peer learning going on. But it's an ongoing challenge for us. The guides do not like being evaluated. But we really put forth and make it very clear in everything we do. Um, it's within our letter of commitment. It's in our policies and procedures manual that evaluation and certification is core and important to our reflective practice in the museum. So we set this forth. So every time I get a new guiding corpse that I'm training, this is really put out there, really put forward, hopefully trying to set expectations correctly. Great. And we've got a bunch of questions, um, at least three questions that I'm seeing that relate to staff involvement. So um, I think, first of all, how did you gain buy-in from the staff, especially the executive director? The executive director was uh, excited to do this mainly because Vizcaya, up until about 10 years ago, really had no uh, museum professional staff. So he as an executive director came in 10 years ago. The museum never had a director of learning, uh, director of education prior to that. So he was trying to formalize and integrate the museum and it was bothersome to him the amount of individualism that the guiding corps had. And the process that they actually had to go through was very intensive because originally the guiding corps was a was a separate entity. They were a 501c3 nonprofit and they had to go through the process of breaking down that entire uh, 501c3 and bringing the corpse into the museum. That was a process that happened. Great. Um, I realize I say great at the end of every one of your answers, but it's good. Practice, right? uh, that's right. You're that's right. <laughs> I can paraphrase your answers too. Um, so again, more staff questioning of was there any need for training the staff as these changes were made or did the staff receive any of the kind of training that the docents, the guides were being given and how many staff were involved in the whole change? Was, was it just a single person in, in your position and your predecessors that were, you know, doing yeah. the leading of discussions, etc.? There were essentially three staff members from the learning division. So at the time, that was what was called the volunteer guides manager, the school and public programs manager, and the director of education. The executive director played a role, though, in terms of helping, you know, that, that bigger change happen where, you know, the dissolution of the 501c3 and bringing them in and maybe mitigating any issues with, with donors, et cetera, and so forth. What was really fortunate is that between the executive director, who has a background as being an education director, um, formerly for the Brooklyn Museum, and has an, an educational background as well. Um, he was in concert with the director of education and the school and public programs education in terms of educational philosophy. So the ideas of open-ended inquiry, the value of it, the value of visitor-centered experience. So that was something very fortunate. And other, this, this gets to that point I said about context, right? That you could be in another environment where, you know, those ideas just aren't thought of uh, as important or the best direction from, say, the executive director. It's hard to get the buy-in to do that kind of change. But when you have it from the highest or, or most influential position in the museum, it was very useful. And how long did the whole process take from the decision to, you know, make this big change to getting down to those 30 guides who are giving, to, or to that stage of evaluation, external evaluation, where they found honest, out. I'd say it took five years to get, like, moving, like, where it's a process. Up, oh, you've frozen up. Excuse me? <laughs> you froze up for just a second. I think oh. you're unfrozen now. Okay. So I'd say five years, but it's still an ongoing process. 
And another interesting aspect is obviously as I train new guides, they come in with this process. It's how they're trained. It's what they know. So you have these two different levels. You have guides that have been there 10, 15 years where this has been a paradigm shift. Some have bought in. Some just really wanted to remain with the museum and they kind of fake it. <laughs> you know, they really don't buy into it. They really don't believe in it. So there are different levels of, uh, of implementation and how well it works. But I think as we're moving forward, we're getting a, a stronger, a stronger, and a more consistent uh, fidelity of our implementation. Great. Um, and just to throw out there for a contest, context for other people is here at the Nasher, um, we went through a similar change probably about four years ago and instead of sticking to volunteers we changed from uh, volunteer docents to paid gallery guides and so all the things you're saying are resonating completely with this about you know the new ones that come in it's it's easier to work with them you get them fresh um, one of the questions that I'm um, I'm curious about, so I'm going as moderator, I get to select this one. What's the recertification process like, and how often are, gu are guides asked to recertify? Guides are asked to recertify on a biannual basis. Um, the process consists of they have to observe a tour of a peer and use a, a reflection tool that we have, and then they are observed by me and a mentor guide, and we also use a reflection tool. After that tour where we observe them, we have about a half hour, 45 minute conversation. If the tour did not go well, they're offered to do another observation and they can do as many practice tours as they want in between, in a, you know, within a reasonable time, within the next two or three weeks. I haven't had, you know, a guide that has not been able to be recertified, so I noticed some question about is, if there was a consolation or anything. I, I have not experienced that yet. Um, so that's the basic process. Again, the mentors play a big role in that. And I open up the table when we have that conversation for them to really be a part of it. Though I lead it, um, I definitely want them playing a role, and I think that helps with the trust level. Great. And how involved were the guides in either crafting the new tours or the whole process of you know, having that kind of, I mean, I'm sure it's not a script, but, you know, that outline. Right. Um, they were involved in, in uh, less in its construct, in the, the initial writing, because they're just not trained in, in those methodologies. You know, it, it's difficult for them to understand really what conditional language is, is something they have to be trained on. But where they were highly useful and where they were incorporated was as the Git was getting developed, it would be practiced with guides in the gallery, and then there would be discussions about, well, how did that feel? You know, what happened? What's working? What's not? And that, um, those responses were then taken by staff and utilized during the refinement process of the Git. I just want to mention, though, that Git is under, not constant, but each year is, is looked at. So right now I'm in the process of still refining it based on observations and specific guide comments on, you know, this may sound like a great open-ended question on paper, but, you know, it just clearly it doesn't work that well. It's not getting the guests to do something. So, you know, I try to, to not just make them feel, but actually take the guide's comments and observations and respond to those on a regular basis. Great. Um, and thinking about the whole use of VTS as a reflective tool but not actually using it on tours can you speak a little bit more to that how you know how they reacted to that and how that's working you know does it just put them in the right frame of mind um, and how do the guides react to switching back and forth between you know super constructivist and a more you know directed question uh, I think it's really challenging for them um, I just want to be clear I don't train them in VTS, but I do utilize VTS as part of the training process. So thereby using it as a model. You know, so if you if we're not going to go back, but if you notice within the presentation, so the progression of practice, there was linking in there, paraphrasing. I mean we ask that these things get done. So I utilize it as a way to model an example because 
with VTS, for example, if I want to talk about paraphrasing, doing a VTS is a great way to show how you paraphrase because you're doing it all the time. So it works as a good tool as modeling specific behaviors, but I make it very clear what we're looking for. So if I do a VTS for once, you know, when we're done, I'm going to have a long conversation about paraphrasing. If I do it another time, I'm going to have a long conversation about linking, you know, or about remaining neutral. So it's these specific transferable skills, and I'm always making it clear, like, that's what we're trying to pull away from, what, from this experience that I'm sharing with them. So it's, it's an informal VTS training. Mm -hmm. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and as far as structure, is this just for the, um, the guides who are giving kind of adult public tours, or is this similar for school tours? It's similar for school tours. So school tours are, are specialized because uh, we have within the general volunteer guides, there's a group of school program guides. And those are guides that staff actually identifies and taps, ask if they want to be a part of that, and then are trained on the school tours. We have about 12 thematic school tours. But the consistency is that, obviously, we are incorporating this visitor-centered, inquiry-based methodology. So that's like the link between the two. But, uh, you know, the, the 12 theme tours are quite difficult, and I think dealing with children is obviously a very, or students, is a very different uh, environment than dealing with the general public. So we have a core amount of guides who do that. Nice. Um, one of the big questions about use of time, one of the main reasons, or in retrospect, we've been able to think about the monetization of staff time managing docents versus managing paid part-time employees. And so Michelle has a, you know, to back up and, and, and just address that and, um, expressly is that we're spending a lot less staff time with paid part-time gallery guides than with docents. So Michelle is asking about how much time you spend observing and coaching and how you think that compares to the amount of time that was previously spent on managing the docents? That's a good question. Again, I'm only seven months in, but if I were to throw a number, I'd be, I think I also have five part-time staff that we call learning program facilitators. And they do, their focus is school tours, but they also conduct the GITs. So, I mean, I'd say I spend a third of my time with the volunteer guide corps, at least a third with these, uh, these five LPFs and a third acting as an administrator, you know, within the museum as some kind of division. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it's it's changed. You know, when I started a few months ago, I was spending 100% of my time <laughs> trying to observe and learn the tours and just understand who the guides are. So it's a great question, but hard for me to answer in a way that's, uh, I think, useful to colleagues because I just haven't been doing it long enough. Sure. Well, then... I'll answer from our perspective is that with the docents, we estimated that two full-time staff people were spending at least a full day a week on docents. So, you know, think about a fifth of two full-time staff member salaries and, you know, the amount of time that we spend now on managing gallery guides, training them, et cetera, is a fraction of that. Um, so. Again, ours is a little bit different in that we pay them, but if you think about the amount of time or the cost of two full-time staff member salaries, a fifth of that, I think it really balances out in what we end up paying them. So I find it just much less hassle, much less headache. Um, whenever I see questions on listservs about problem docents, et cetera, et cetera, I am thankful all over again that uh, we get to work with paid people, and I hope that it's not difficult for people to hear. It's not a brag. It is um, just excitement. Well, it's a direction we're moving in. We started off with uh, three LPFs two years ago. We're up to five now, and we have ideas of expanding that group. But just to address that, again, that goes back to this transition of how much you know, how much resources can you devote to your volunteer guide? So, you know, by going through this process and by whittling them down to a, a manageable group of 30 who are completely active, you know, doing at least uh, 
anywhere between th three and six tours per month. It helps, you know, alleviate a lot of the management. You know, I'm not spending time, you know, getting coffee for meetings and, you know, figuring out who's going to do this lecture and so on and so forth. The core is to do tours. And I just want to throw out, I mean, since we're speaking amongst colleagues, one of the biggest challenges I've had, I've never spent this much time managing volunteers, but I think something, it's a challenge and something that's unique with the museums is that volunteers with your museums, and I hope this doesn't come across wrong, but I have found are a little less altruistic than volunteers you would find, you know, in a hospital or in a, a children's center, what have you. And, you know, there's this battle of why they're there, and often they're there for them selves for their self-betterment, for their, their lifelong learning. All of those are valid and lovely goals, but so what the biggest challenge is I have, it gets lost that they, they need to be there to service the museum's need, and if they're not, that's that imbalance, that's a problem that's happening. And it didn't fully solve it, but part of this integration, you know, helped address those issues where it was helping to balance those scales more. Absolutely. So I'll I'll switch to um, Michelle's question about expectations from visitors, and I don't know how many repeat visitors you have, or if you have locals who bring friends who are vacationing. You know, have their expectations changed now that you've drastically altered the way that tours are given? Right. A very good question. Again, that relates to context. We have. Well over 70% of our daily visitors are people who are not from Miami. They're, so we, have, we don't have a lot of repeat visitors, but that is a core focus in our strategic plan. So we need to address that issue and also understand that if we come up with a tour like the Git and it's moving and working now, we really have to think, well, what is the lifespan of that? Because <laughs> we can't do it forever, right? It, I mean, for many reasons, right, for repeat visitors, but also for guides. I mean, they're enjoying it. I mean, the, the great part is because it in, involves and it's visitor-centered, each tour is different because you're hearing different responses, different perspectives, conversations go in a uh, different sequence according to, like, what visitors are seeing or noticing. But we really need to consider that idea of repeat visitors and keeping things fresh. So we're thinking now, like, well, what is the lifespan of the Git and what's next? which we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, a question that is uh, always challenging with any person, whether it's a volunteer or paid me staff member, is thank you for your service, but conversations. How do you um, start those? And it sounds like maybe you didn't have to since you had your core guide group when you got there, but I don't right. know if you've had to, had to dismiss anybody um, since you've been there or what? <laughs> I have not had to dismiss anyone. I mean, our process for recruitment is that we have a recruitment event, and we then have actually roundtable uh, informal interviews with the people who attend that event. And from there, when everyone leaves, we, we, we thank them for coming and tell them that they'll either hear, they'll, they'll hear from us with either an invite or a thank you. So that's one vetting process that's nice, and it's, it's a little impersonal because they're there, but then you're sending them, you know, based on how what they filled out. You write a nice letter, of course. You're not, a, you know, it's not. It doesn't seem like this is a great fit or what have you. Um, I haven't had to dismiss anyone, but again, for me, the philosophy and the tack done nicely. I think it's always putting forth of we need to question why a volunteer is there, you know, and are the museum's needs being serviced? Service? And is the volunteer getting something out of that service? So, you know, it's the museum, in a sense, being first, though. I mean, that's the purpose, or it should be the purpose of someone volunteering at the museum. So, you know, most presumably when things go wrong, it's because they're not putting the museum first. So I think that's a nice tact to take. You know, it, you're, it's, it's not personal. It's about the museum. It's about the philosophy of the, of the volunteer program and whether they're, you know, meeting that philosophy or not. Definitely. And I'll address that also from my personal experience is um, related to this is during our transition, we had these other opportunities. There was a question about, do you have any other opportunities to volunteer consolation prizes, basically? And when we made the transition, we had some other volunteer opportunities. Um, 
One was a speaker's bureau, which was basically to create slide lectures to take out to local retirement communities, et cetera. So the idea was that it was appealing to those who wanted to give the art history lecture, and they could still do that. But um, for many reasons, it we tried it for a year. It didn't ever really take off. The other opportunity that they had was to become a kind of an on-call volunteer, and that would be to do things like stuff mailings, etc. when we needed it. Um, I've worked other places where there's been a mail club, and it was the prestigious volunteer opportunity because it was this, you know, great group of people, all women, who met every Tuesday and chatted up a storm, ate Danish, and stuffed all the mailings. So, um, but again, that never really took off with us either. So, um, and when I, to answer uh, Christine's question a little bit more directly, thank you for your service, but it's unfortunately sometimes just having to harden yourself and be very factual. Um, I once observed a person who was in the guide training and she really had not internalized our style which sounds very similar to Mark's um, and so it was just a matter of repeating multiple times that it you know after that observation after in that conversation with her saying it's you're really not your methods and your style is not matching up with us. And again, uh, connecting back to what you're saying, Mark, of that it's not meeting the museum's needs right now. All right. And Christine had a follow-up question of what kind of appreciation you, and thanks you give to your to your current gallery guides. Right. So, I mean, there's two ways I do that. One is subtle, which is I'm very responsive to their, uh, their emails. <laughs> So, you know, I, I make them feel as much as I can that they're attended to. Um, the other aspect that I also do is that anything internal that goes on about the museum, a change about something, a uh, collection switch, some extra information that goes around, I send out to them. So they're getting lots of information. They love information. So even though if our tours are no longer, you know, focused specifically on the delivery of art history and art information, the more I send them about that and about the museum, they just love it. So that's a subtle way where like they're constantly getting things and they're they're always complimenting me. Outside of that, once a year we have an appreciation reception. So we have a really lovely reception in the evening. It's only for the volunteer guides. And guides receive a certificate who exceed their, you know, their tour credit expectations. So that that's basically it. That's what we do at this time. Is that different than what what is happening in the past when they were a 501c3? Was there more adulation then, or has that? Do you know if that's altered in any way? It's completely different because they basically had the run of their own show. I mean, they were they they were self-adulating. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they had a big space in the library in the within the museum that's now like the entire learning division's office. It used to be the guides library. You know, they used to have events. They would run, you know, rent buses and do a lot of things. You know, so they lost a lot of that, but uh, they weren't doing any kind of formal because they didn't have credits to meet mm -hmm. as a five hundred one c three. So now they have sp uh, specific expectations. And again, because it's a smaller group, people know each other well. You know, they get excited. There, not many of them, but there is a small amount of competitiveness. <laughs> And, and the amount of tours that, you know, some of them give, which is cute. Well, I don't, oh, we've just got another question. But before I um, jump to uh, Michelle's, uh, Michelle has given us a, a nice thank you, but I will, we're almost at the end of our time, but how often do you meet with them for kind of maintenance training or, or what's that like? We have, uh, there are four continuing education sessions throughout the year sort of evenly spaced. And one way we do it to just to try to meet their schedules is we we hold the exact same continuing education session on a Tuesday and then on a Saturday. Um, so we have that. As I mentioned, I'm on the floor regularly. We have the appreciation event. We have a holiday party. And we also have a, a, the, during Guides appreciate, Volunteer Appreciation Week in the spring, another reception. So they have three receptions throughout the year and four CE sessions. 
The school program guides also have uh, three CE sessions throughout the year. So those are our formalized uh, trainings. Excellent. Um, I think we're at a good stopping point. Was there anything else that you wanted to add before we wrap things up? No, just again, it was great. It was great working with you. you know, <laughs> I think it was a very cool process. So I'm glad I was able to participate. Absolutely. And yeah, this has been a real learning curve. Mark and I had a few <laughs> frustrating experiences over the last week um, experimenting with it. So to all you museum educators out there, persevere with the technology. Um, so glad that you joined us today and just want to remind you that next Tuesday afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, um, we'll have another hangout and that one will be focusing on teens. So. Um, I do hope you will join us again, and if you miss any part of this or you want to go back and look at the others or you can't be here live next Tuesday, all of these are recorded and accessible through the G Plus site, and you can find us on YouTube as well. So thanks, everybody. Hope everyone has a good weekend, and um, we look forward to seeing you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.